Good morning. Good morning. Hope everyone is doing well this morning. And I want to thank you so very much for coming back. Looking forward to the day with you this session and then two sessions later today, this afternoon at 5 o'clock. And then the next one is at 7, 7.30? 7.30. Okay, so looking forward to those with you. I just want to give you a little bit of background information for me. I was born and reared in Mississippi, in Vicksburg, Mississippi, and spent all of my um, childhood there and early adult years there. My parents still live there. I have one sister, and she's married and has three kids, and um, went to seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, and then, um, long story short, got married five years ago. I, um, the Lord brought a, a wonderful lady into my life named Kathy, and so uh, Kathy and I got married five years ago. Kathy was actually saved out of the Roman Catholic Church. She was a Roman Catholic for most of her life, and, and God saved her out of that. And uh, now, uh, ever since her salvation, Kathy has really been a student of God's Word, and she knows God's Word very, very well. She's uh, uh, you know, quite the Bible scholar in her, in her own right. And uh, so very knowledgeable in the scriptures, very sound doctrine, and she's been a, a, just a tremendous blessing to me. Uh, we were living in Oklahoma, but we moved from Oklahoma about six months ago to northern Idaho. And so we live in northern Idaho now, a little town called Sandpoint, Idaho, and we just built a home there, and that's kind of where my ministry is, is based out of. Uh, my wife was a widow. She was married before she got married to me. Her husband died suddenly uh, about eight years ago, just quite literally, quite literally dropped dead. He had a massive heart attack. And uh, so, uh, but she had three kids with, um, with her first husband, John. And so, you know, now they're mine, so to speak, and uh, not my biological, but uh, think of them as mine. But uh, we're past the years of having any more kids, and so, um, but uh, the kids are, are grown. Kathy's children are, are basically grown and on their own, so, uh, but we live, just the two of us, in our little house in northern Idaho, and, and um, really enjoy it there. So I, I have this ministry. God has graciously opened up for me. I travel across the United States quite a bit, and internationally as well, uh, preaching and teaching God's Word. My my first love is expositional preaching, just preaching God's Word verse by verse. But, uh, of course, I'm probably most known for the seminar that I'm doing here with you is the Clouds Without Water. It's what most people know me for, but I enjoy preaching as well. Uh, we go to a very good church in northern Idaho, uh, Kootenai Community Church, very, very doctrinally sound church. And uh, my pastor is a really good guy named Jim Osmond. In fact, I will tell you about a book that he wrote uh, probably later today. I want to make you aware of that. A good resource for you. So, anyway, that's, um, that's me in a nutshell. So, all right. Well, let's begin. We got it up there. Good. Clouds Without Water. This session is entitled Dangerous Doctrines. Today, I want us to look at the metaphysical cultic origins of the Word of Faith movement and then some of the standard doctrines that the prosperity preachers teach that deviate from historical Christianity. And um, in order to really understand a movement, it really helps to know something about the origins of the movement. So where did the Word of Faith movement, this health and wealth prosperity gospel, begin? It began with a man named Phineas Parkhurst Quimby. Quimby, we could call the great-grandfather of the Word of Faith movement. Quimby was the father of New Thought, a metaphysical cult. And when I say metaphysical, that's a big word, but all it means is beyond the physical realm, beyond what we can see and touch here. Uh, So Quimby was the father of the metaphysical cult known as New Thought. New Thought essentially held that whatever you think about you will attract to yourself. If you think positive thoughts, you will attract positive things to yourself. If you think negative thoughts, you will attract negative things to yourself. And it holds that sickness 
and disease is the result of negative thinking. So if you're sick, it's because you've been thinking negative thoughts and you have attracted these things to yourself. Uh, so he was the father of the metaphysical cult known as New Thought. He was a student of occultism, hypnosis, parapsychology. And his theoretical formulations served as the basis for what is today known as Christian science. You've probably heard of Christian science. Uh, Christian science is very poorly named, by the way, because Christian science is not Christian and it's not scientific. But uh, Mary Baker Eddy claimed that she was physically healed by Phineas Quimby. She really wasn't, but she thought that she was. And she took his doctrines and developed them a bit further. And from that formed what is today known as Christian science. And there are a lot of Christian science overtones in the modern Word of Faith, Health and Wealth Gospel. One of which is the denial of physical symptoms when it comes to sickness and disease. If you have a friend or a family member who is involved in this movement to one degree or another, you might notice that when they get sick, they deny that they're sick. Uh, maybe they have a cold. Their eyes are watering, their nose is running, they're congested, they're sneezing, you know, the whole nine yards. You can tell that they're sick, but you ask them, well, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. You know, they, they don't admit it. They don't, they don't want to confess that because they might confess it into existence. Well, this is Christian science and new thought. This, this health and wealth prosperity gospel is not Christian, dear friends. It is cultic theology that has been wrapped in some Christianese, wrapped in some Christian lingo to make it appear to be Christian, but it really is not. Essek W. Kenyon we could call the grandfather of the word faith movement. Kenyon had very clear ties to the metaphysical cults, particularly the New Age and New Thought movements. Uh, Kenyon was right on a number of different doctrines, but he was wrong on a number of, of different doctrines as well. And just briefly, I won't go into all of this, but give you a little list. Kenyon held that God created not ex nihilo, as we say, not out of nothing, but rather God created by speaking faith-filled words. And his words were containers of a literal, tangible substance called faith. And so when God spoke, his words of faith created the universe. And everything is created, everything is made out of faith. The, the clothes you're wearing, it's made out of faith. The chair you're sitting in, uh, it's made out of faith. And the prosperity preachers teach that we too can use our own words of faith. We can speak things into existence and create our own physical reality. And a couple of the other doctrines here. He taught that Jesus died not only a physical death, but died a spiritual death as well. We'll look at that in just a little bit. And he taught that health and wealth are obtainable by the believer's positive confession. So if you need money, you can speak it into existence. If you need healing, you speak it into existence. And this is one of the standard doctrines of the word, faith, health, and wealth movements. Kenneth Hagin is the father of the modern word of faith movement. And despite Kenneth Hagin's teaching that no Christian should die until he's at least 120 years old, you see that Kenneth Hagin didn't quite make it. He was uh, about 85, a little bit short of his 86th birthday when he died. But Kenneth Hagin, like all of the prosperity preachers, claimed that much of what they taught people they received through direct divine revelation knowledge. In other words, they would say, well, I'm going to teach you these things, but if you can't find these doctrines in the scriptures, uh, it's okay, don't worry about it, because I have it from the highest authority. Jesus himself came and gave me these teachings. So if you can't find it in the scripture, don't worry about it. It's okay. I got it from Jesus. Hagen claimed that Jesus physically appeared to him eight different occasions throughout the course of his life. And on one of these occasions, Hagen claims that Jesus gave him these exact words. Kenneth Hagin claims that Jesus physically appeared to him and gave him these exact words. 
It's interesting, however, that Jesus apparently bears a striking resemblance to Essex W. Kenyon. If you can see, it's practically word for word identical. Hagen did not get this from Jesus. Hagen plagiarized Essex W. Kenyon, among other writers as well, plagiarized them extensively. So the prosperity preachers are very fond of claiming divine origin for what they teach. But as you can see, the origins are not nearly so supernatural. They just steal from other people. In fact, uh, 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 we just read that, did we not, in Jeremiah 23, how the false prophets steal one another's words. Same thing here. Okay, I want us to look now at some of the doctrines of the Word of Faith movement. Let's begin by looking at the doctrine of positive confession. The faith preachers teach that we can literally speak things into existence. Watch these short clips. Look at me, say, 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 all, all of you. Say, there's power in me, power in me. To, speak life and death. to speak life and death. You call what you have. You say what you want. And I'm here to tell you, I know that I know that I know that as these programs are airing, I, I'm speaking something into existence. Amen. Benny Hinn says that he is speaking something into existence. And if that sounds eerily like God's act of creation in Genesis 1 and 2, uh, that's because it is. Dear friends, only God can speak things into existence. That is not an ability that you and I have. But the faith preachers, the New Apostolic Reformation, these people blur that line between God the Creator and us His created. They demote God to make Him look more human than what He is, and then in turn they deify man, and they make us look a lot more like God than what we really are. Now, in case you're thinking, oh, well, Justin, you're just taking these people out of context. You know, Benny Hinn doesn't really teach that we can actually speak things into existence just like God did. I mean, that's, that's not really what they teach, is it? Well, yeah, actually it is. Look at this. This is a tweet from Creflo Dollar. Creflo Dollar says... As spiritual beings who possess the nature of God, we have the ability to speak things into existence just like God did. So yes, they do teach this. Yes, they do, absolutely. They blur that line between God the Creator and us His created. Listen to this uh, audio clip between Kenneth Copeland and Paul and Jan Crouch. Does God use faith? Surely. Now, now see, here's a sore spot. There are those not with who him. say. Not with, not, not with you. No, no, no. <laughs> not with God. I'm not, in fact, I'm not sore at God at all, and I don't think he's sore at me. I, don't, I haven't done anything to him. <laughs> no, but the, the critics say God is God. He doesn't have to have faith. He doesn't exercise faith. He doesn't use faith. He's God. He's the object of faith. Oh, wait a minute. What does that mean? I don't know what that means. I don't either. Did you catch that? Uh, Kenneth Copeland said, Now, wait a minute. What does that mean, God is the object of our faith? I don't know what that means. And then you hear Jan Crouch say, Well, I don't either. Friends, that's stunning. The fact that God is the object of our faith I mean, that's first grade Sunday school stuff. You don't get more basic than that. That's Christianity 101. I mean, that's ground level. And, and here's Kenneth Copeland who says that he doesn't understand what it means to say that God is the object of our faith. Because you see, in the prosperity gospel, God is not the object of faith. Faith is the object of faith. You see, in the prosperity gospel, faith is not placed in God. Faith is a force that you direct at God to make him do what you want him to do. And it's really ironic when you think about it that these people who call themselves faith preachers don't even understand what faith is. They do not even understand what faith 
is. And again, unless you're thinking, oh, well, this is just an isolated statement, they don't really teach that you're really supposed to have faith in your faith. They, surely they don't teach that. Yeah, actually they do. This from Jesse Duplantis. Jesse Duplantis writes in his magazine last year, he says, the Bible says that every man has been given the measure of faith. Have faith in your faith, not faith in God, have faith in your faith and step over into the faith zone, whatever that is. How powerful are our words? Well, so powerful that uh, we can even control the weather. Watch this from Gloria Copeland. You know, you're, the, you're supposed to control the weather. I mean, Ken's the primary weatherman at our house, but when he's not there, I do it. He can see what's happening out there. It shows just like they have on at the weather, like on the news. I mean, he's got the computer, has got the current weather on it and all that for flying. So uh, sometimes I'll hear something. I'll hear the thunder start. Maybe he'll still be asleep. And I say, Ken, you need to do something about this. <laughs> and knowing that, but you are the one that has authority over the weather. One day, Ken and Pat Boone, we were in Hawaii at their house, and we were, they were sitting outside, and there was a weather spout out over the ocean. And that's like a tornado, except it hits the water. And so they were sitting there, and they just watched it, rebuked it. It never did anything. One day, I was in the airplane in the back, and my little brother was in the back with me, and Ken was up front flying. And we were not in the weather, because we don't fly bad weather. But we, we could see the weather over here. And I looked out the window, and that tornado came down just like this, down toward the ground. And Ken said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You get back up there. So this is how I learned how to talk to tornadoes. I saw this. And that tornado went, woo, 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 woo. <laughs> Even while I was watching him, my little brother was not a devout Christian at that time, and that was really good for him to see. <laughs> so you're the weatherman. You get out there, or the weather woman, whichever it is, and you talk to that thing, and you tell it, you're not coming here, I command you to dissipate, and you get back up there in Jesus' name. Glory to God. That, that, I won't charge you extra. Now, that is so absurd. It really doesn't even need a comment, but uh, if you will indulge me, I'll offer a, a couple of brief ones. The first thing did you notice how uh, Gloria Copeland says that we can control the weather, but we don't fly in bad weather? <laughs> Why not? I mean, if you can control the weather, fly through whatever you want to fly through. You know, honestly, just a little common sense goes a long way in clearing a lot of this stuff up. But aside from that, if it is true, and that's a huge if, but if it is true that Gloria Copeland can control the weather. And it's not just Gloria Copeland. Creflo Dollar says he can do it. Rod Parsley says he can do it. Jesse Duplantis says he can do it. They all claim to be able to control the weather. If they can control the weather, then I would submit to you that these prosperity preachers should be charged with thousands of cases of negligent homicide each and every year. Because every year all around the world, there are thousands of people who are killed in weather-related disasters. Floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, typhoons, whatever you call them, uh, uh, droughts, thousands of people. So if they can control the weather but just choose not to do it, then they should be charged with negligent homicide, thousands of cases. But you know, I'm not really that hard-nosed. I don't really believe that the prosperity preachers should actually be charged with thousands of cases of negligent homicide because they can't do what they claim they can do. They can't control the weather any more than you and I can. There is only one who is in control of the weather. And it's not any of these clowns. You recall the angel giving the announcement to Elizabeth and Zechariah that they would give that they would have a baby boy. Remember this in Luke's gospel. And when Zechariah heard about this, he 
question it, didn't he? Because they were older, they were advanced in years, past childbearing age. And so Zechariah questioned this a little bit. What did God do in response to Zechariah's uh, questioning? What did he do? Closed his mouth, right? Made him a mute. For a very interesting take on why God closed Zechariah's mouth, this from Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen says this. He said, why did God take away his speech? It's because God knew that Zechariah's negative words would cancel out his plan. See, God knows the power of our words. He knows that we prophesy our future, and he knew Zechariah's own negative words would stop his plan. Wow. So according to Joel Osteen, God was up in heaven looking down, and he saw Zechariah making negative confessions, and God just went into a panic. Oh, my goodness, what am I ever going to do? I, I wasn't counting on this. And so in a last-ditch effort to save his plan of redemption, God had to reach down and close Zachariah's mouth and make him a mute. Whew, boy, that was a close one. Unbelievable, unbelievable. These people have no concept of the sovereignty of God, none. The God, little g God, of the prosperity gospel is a very weak, very indecisive, very effeminate God. And it is not the God of the Bible. It is not the God of the Bible. I want to show you this for observation. This is just interesting. Came across this book entitled Supreme Influence. Now, I was in a bookstore, and this is in the New Age section of the bookstore, okay? This is New Age. This is not Christian, doesn't even pretend to be Christian. But the title is Supreme Influence. Look at the subtitle. Change your life with the power of the language you use. Okay? Nothing Christian about this. Now, for comparison, let me show you a quote-unquote Christian book by Joyce Meyer. Change your words, change your life, understanding the power of every word you speak. Huh. Interesting, is it not? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's the same teaching. This is not Christian. It's cultic. Cultic doctrine that has been wrapped in some Christian terminology. One of the core doctrines of the Word of Faith movement is what is known as the little God's doctrine. The faith preachers teach that if you are a Christian, you are in fact a little God. Watch this video clip from Creflo Dollar. Creflo Dollar undoubtedly is the most appropriately named of the prosperity preachers, but watch this from Creflo Dollar. Now, in verse 26 and verse 27, God now submits himself to this principle of everything producing after its own kind. And in verse 26 and 27, let's read it out loud. Ready? Read. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now that's interesting because if everything produces after its own kind, we now see God producing man. And if God now produces man, and everything produces after its own kind. If horses get together, they produce what? And if dogs get together, they produce what? If cats get together, they produce what? But if the Godhead gets together and say, let us, make man, then what are they producing? They're producing gods. 
Now, I got to hit this thing real hard in the very beginning because I ain't got time to go through all this. But I'm going to say to you right now, you are God's, little g. You are God's because you came from God and you are God's. You're not just human. The only human part about you is this physical body that you live in. The real me is just like God. The real me is just like God. Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Friends, when the Bible says that God created man in his image, that means that as human beings, you and I are the pinnacle of God's creation. We are the pinnacle of his creation. And we have the potential and the capacity through a saving relationship with Jesus Christ to know God. None of the other created order has that privilege and ability. Um, I love dogs. I do. I, I love dogs. I grew up with Labrador Retrievers, Black Labs, and I, and I love dogs. But the greatest, smartest dog in the world will never know God because dogs are not created in God's image. And cats for sure aren't. But <laughs> just kidding. Sort of. But we are. We have the potential and the capacity through a saving relationship with Jesus Christ to know God, but that does not mean we are God. The Bible is very clear that there is only one God, and He is a jealous God who will not share His glory with another. And if I remember my Bible correctly, wasn't the desire to be just like God? kind of what led to the whole fall thing in the first place? Was that not the very first temptation in the garden? The very first temptation, which led to the very first sin, the desire to be just like God, that's what led to this whole fallen state in the first place. And yet the prosperity preachers want you to, want you to believe it. They teach it as truth. How ironic. Who else in the Bible wanted to be just like God? Satan, he wanted the worship that God was getting for himself. And he rose up in rebellion against God, and it got him and a third of the angels along with him kicked out of heaven. And so this little God's doctrine is quite literally, quite literally, a doctrine of demons. It's a doctrine of demons. But this little God's doctrine is at the heart of, of the Word of Faith movement, New Apostolic Reformation movement. It is at the heart of it. And I want to show you what I mean. Let's look at what the faith preachers teach about the doctrine of the fall. A few items here. Number one, the faith preachers teach that Adam was an exact duplicate of God. He was not a little like God. He was not a lot like God. That, that he literally was God. That God, when God created Adam, God reproduced himself in Adam. Adam was a carbon copy of Yahweh. Well, we all know what happened, right? Adam sinned, which of course begs the question, if Adam was, was Yahweh and he sinned, was it Yahweh who sinned? You see, you carry these doctrines out to their logical conclusion and you see how very dark they are. But when Adam sinned, he lost his deity, lost his godhood, transferred it to Satan, when this happened, the real Yahweh God lost his legal right to planet Earth and was kicked out. So according to classic word of faith theology, I mean, you'll find a little small variances here and there, but according to classic word of faith theology, the real Yahweh God is up there somewhere, but he's got no access to planet Earth. He's been kicked out of his own creation. And in case you think that they don't actually teach this, this is from Kenneth Copeland. This is an email I got from Kenneth Copeland. Y'all don't tell Kenneth Copeland I'm on his email list. But this came, uh, what, what are we, like a month and a half ago, March 29th? Kenneth Copeland said this. But when he turned, referring to Adam, when he turned and gave that dominion to Satan, look where it left God. It left God on the outside looking in. He can't do anything down there. He had no legal right to do anything about it. Could he manipulate and operate? No. 
because he'd be doing the very same thing that Satan did in the first place. And if God had injected himself illegally into the earth, what Satan intended for him to do was to fall for it and pull off an illegal act and turn the light off in God and subordinate God to himself. Now you can see the complicated predicament that God's in. You can understand why someone would say, wonder why God lets all those wars go on. He doesn't. There's not anything he can do about it. So God is just completely helpless. His hands are tied. According to the faith preachers, once God was kicked out of planet Earth, Satan became the legal God of planet Earth. Dear friends, Satan is not the legal God of planet Earth. God is the legal God of planet Earth. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the Apostle Paul does refer to Satan as the, the God of this age. The word in the Greek is the word aeon and literally means age. Paul is referring to Satan as the God of this age. Paul is making a theological point, not a legal point. Paul is saying that this world is so fallen, so depraved, that it follows after Satan as if he were the God of this age, but not the legal God of planet Earth. The earth, says the psalmist, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. God is the legal God of planet Earth. But according to the prosperity preachers, guess what happens when a person gets saved? Guess what he gets back? Oh, he regains his godhood. He becomes God again. He regains his deity, becomes God just like Adam supposedly was before he fell. And this is why the prosperity preachers hold so tenaciously to health and wealth, because we're gods. And a God cannot be poor, and a God certainly cannot be sick. So many people, even if they don't buy into this movement, they think, oh, it's just about health and wealth, you know, just uh, fancy, showy stuff. No, health and wealth, that's just some of the bad fruit off of a rotten tree. But the, the, the problem goes much deeper. It is, it, the, the tree of the Word of Faith movement is rotten to its core. The theology is rotten, and so it produces bad fruit. But I will say this. The promise of health and wealth is one of the things that makes this movement so appealing and yet so dangerous at the same time. Because the prosperity gospel says, if you'll just come to Jesus, then he'll make you rich. He will heal your body. You won't have to be sick anymore. They appeal to two of the most basic and universal of all human desires. Most people want to be wealthy. Most people would like to be rich. And very, very few people enjoy being sick. You know, there's a few people out there, I suppose, that just like the attention that comes when you, you're sick. But most people don't want to be sick. And so the prosperity preachers say, if you'll just come to Jesus, then you can have it. So you're telling me that if I come to Jesus, if I ask Jesus into my heart, God will make me wealthy? And God will heal me? That's what you're saying Jesus will do for me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I like that, Jesus. That, I like that. Yeah, I'll try, Jesus. You're telling me that's what Christianity is? Uh, I can be wealthy and healed? <laughs> Sign me up. But is that the real gospel? Or is the real gospel something a little bit more like this? Come to Jesus because you're a sinner. And because of your sin, the righteous wrath of God abides on you. God's bow of wrath is drawn back. And the only way to have that wrath removed is to repent of sins. Turn from sins. Once you have a godly sorrow over your sins, turn from sins. Place your trust in the risen Lord Jesus Christ and His finished work on the cross. And then you will be saved. You will have heaven. But on this earth, we're not promised money. 
We're not promised healing. What does Jesus promise us? Tribulation. Persecution. What does the Bible say? Some of those who live godly in Christ Jesus may be persecuted. Is that what it says? All who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And that's not as popular, you say, as to say to come to Jesus because he'll make you rich. You won't have to be sick anymore. Friends, if you come to Jesus for those reasons, you've come for the wrong reasons. It's a false decision, a false conversion. And I fear, I tremble for the tens and tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people who have responded to the prosperity gospel, but they have not responded to the true gospel. They have not responded to the true gospel. There is no prosperity gospel. There is no social gospel. There are no adjectives to the gospel, dear ones. If you have to add an adjective to the gospel, you've got a different gospel. There is no prosperity gospel. There is no social gospel. There is just the gospel. And it is, this prosperity gospel is a different gospel. Watch this video clip from Benny Hinn and Miles Monroe. Pastor, we get the mind of God about his will. We pray it. When we pray it, we give him legal right to perform it. Yes. Let me define prayer for you in this show. Prayer is man giving God permission or license to interfere in earth's affairs. In other words, prayer is earthly license for heavenly interference. That's incredible. <laughs> that is incredible. God could do nothing on earth. Nothing has God ever done on earth without a human giving him access. So he's always looking for that somebody. Always looking for a human to give him power, permission. In other words, God has the power, but you get the permission. God got the authority and the power, but you got the license. So even though God could do anything, he can only do what you permit him to do. God can only do what we permit him to do. Dear friends, I would submit to you today that God can do whatever he jolly well wants to do and is not terribly concerned about whether or not he has our permission to do it. Now, don't take my word for it. Let's go to the scriptures, search the scriptures, see if these things are really so. Psalm 115, verse 3, Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Hmm. Now, I have actually had a word of faith person look at that verse. I showed them that verse and they said, oh, well, that just means God can do whatever he wants to do in heaven, not on earth. If he wants to do something on earth, he has to get our permission. Is that right? Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all of the deeps. Oops. Friends, God can do whatever he wants to do and is not losing a great deal of sleep over whether or not he has our permission to do it. He can do whatever he wants to do. He is God. We are not. Watch this from Jesse Duplantis. This will give you an idea of just how arrogant these people are. Watch this from Jesse Duplantis. Friends have frank and open conversations with each other. I've done that with the Lord. I've had the Lord say, uh, Jesse, I've had God come tell me, he said, this is what I'm going to do. I've had the Lord say, what do you think about this? God has asked me for my opinion. God asks Jesse Duplantis for his opinion? Really? 
Well, I don't want to take him out of context, so let's just let Jesse Duplantis finish his thought and show you the rest of the clip. I said, well, Lord, since you ask, maybe I'm doing it. He said, no, we can talk frankly. What do you think? I said, well, I don't think you ought to do that. He said, why you don't think I ought to do that? I said, well, you know, I, I know you know people more than I do, but you know, Lord, if you just let me, let me do a little bit more work on this individual, I think we can get them to you. He says, okay, go ahead. Do what you have to do. And I tell you what, the Bible says, he who wins souls is wise. And he who thinks he can counsel God is a fool. So God comes to Jesse Duplantis, asks him for his opinion, and Jesse tells God, I don't think you ought to do that. Who does this man think he is? Unbelievable. That he is going to counsel the Alpha and Omega? Really? This man doesn't know God. He does not know God. He may know a God that he has created after his own image, but he does not know the God of the Bible. Watch this from Jesse Duplantis. I'm going to say something going to knock your lights off. God has the power to take life, but he can't. he got the power to do it, but he won't. He's bound. He can't. He says death and life is in the power of whose tongue? Yours. You ready for this? You want something to knock your lights off? You choose when you live. You choose when you die. So God has the power to take life, but he can't. I think that might come as a bit of a surprise to a number of people in the Bible. Remember King Herod? When God killed him and he was eaten by worms? Remember Uzzah? Remember when Uzzah, you know, the, the, they were carrying the Ark of the Covenant and the oxen stumbled, remember that? And the, and the Ark started to, to tip over and just instinctively, and you can see this happening in your mind's eye, can't you? Just Uzzah was walking right beside it and just without thinking, Uzzah just reached up to steady the Ark and God struck him dead. You think God isn't holy? Let's see, who else would differ with Mr. Duplantis? Oh, yeah, everybody alive on the face of the earth in that little flood thing, except for eight people. Everybody alive on the face of the earth, God killed. I bet they would beg to differ with Jesse Duplantis. You see the arrogance of these people. You know, and, and, and friends, you know, I'm showing you these video clips of, of the, the big leaders, you know. But, but this same theology, the, the same doctrines are being taught by thousands of churches all around the world. And the Word of Faith movement, the NAR, this Health and Wealth Prosperity Gospel, this is the face of Christianity in most of the world today. This is the, in fact, in all of the world today, this is the face of Christianity. The face of Christianity around the world is either word of faith or it's Roman Catholicism, neither of which are Christian, and oftentimes a blending of, of those things. I want us now to look at what the prosperity preachers teach about the person and work of Jesus Christ. If we can establish that they preach a different Jesus, we can establish that they do indeed preach a different gospel. Many of the word faith preachers have what is essentially an Arianistic view of Christ, Arianism. Arianism was a heresy in the early church. And Arianism basically held that Jesus did not come as God. He just came as a man, a man who had a close walk with God but was not actually God in human flesh. Now, Arianism was dealt with in the Council of Nicaea in the year A.D. 325, so almost 1,700 years ago. And uh, they, they did away with it centuries and centuries ago. But um, it's not dead. Arianism is still alive and well in the Word of Faith movement. Let me show you this from Creflo Dollar. Creflo Dollar says this, And somebody said, Well, Jesus came as God. Well, how many of you know the Bible says God never sleeps nor slumbers? And yet in the book of Mark, we see Jesus asleep in the back of the boat. Jesus came as a man. 
And at age 30, God is now getting ready to demonstrate to us and give us an example of what a man with the anointing can do. Y'all listen, please listen to me, please listen to me. This ain't no heresy. I'm not some false prophet. Dear friends, as a general rule of thumb, if a preacher actually has to tell you that he's not a false prophet, chances are he probably is. So Creflo Dollar says that because Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat, and God never sleeps nor slumbers, and therefore Jesus could not have been God. But that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Dear friends, when Jesus came to this earth, he came as 100% man and 100% God. He was the God-man. And as the God-man, Jesus experienced many of the same things that you and I experience. He got hungry, he got thirsty, and guess what? He got sleepy. It does not mean that he was not God. That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Uh, Watch this from Kenneth Copeland. And Jesus volunteered to go to hell. I'm going to tell you something. Ain't nobody ever got out of there. The only thing he had to go by was the promise of God that I'm reading you right now. He didn't have some special revelation from heaven between he and God the Father. No, the Bible said he emptied himself when he came and he saw himself in the word and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He found himself in the word. So, according to Kenneth Copeland, uh, there was no special relationship between Jesus and God the Father. No, Jesus just walked into the synagogue one day and opened up the scriptures and was just reading along in the scriptures and all of a sudden said, Well, well, I'll be John Brown. Look at here. Look who I am. Jesus had no idea who he was. There was no... Special relationship between him and God the Father. He just found himself in the Word. Had no idea who he was. That is a different Jesus than the Jesus of the Bible. If they preach a different Jesus, they preach a different gospel. And a different gospel does not save. This from Bill Johnson. Bill Johnson says this. Jesus was so empty of divine capacity, eternally God, but he chose to live with the restrictions as a man. Why? To set a model, to set something to follow, an example of his lifestyle. If he did all of his miracles as God, I'm still impressed, but I'm not compelled to follow. He set aside divinity. He set aside divinity and chose to display what life would be like for anyone with no sin. He models for us the normal Christian life. Jesus is the most normal Christian in the Bible. So you see why they do this. You see why they teach that Jesus completely emptied himself of his, of his deity and make him out to be just a man, just a man like one of us, a man with the anointing. Guess who we are? We are men and women with the anointing. And so therefore we are everything that Jesus was. We can do everything that Jesus did. Now, did Jesus empty himself? Did Jesus empty himself? Yes, he did. Let's look at this. Philippians chapter 2. Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being made in the likeness of men. So, It does indeed say that Jesus emptied himself. Now, the question, though, is this. Of what did he empty himself? Did Jesus empty himself of his deity? No. No, he didn't. That's an impossibility. Jesus could not cease to be God. Did Jesus empty himself of any of his his divine attributes? Now, a lot of people think this, and I heard this even growing up as a Baptist, which is not word of faith, at least not theoretically. But I always heard this, that when Jesus was on the earth, uh, he emptied himself of his divine attributes. 
Did he? Who is God? God is a person, triune person, and God contains, has all of the divine attributes, right? Omniscient, omnipotent, omnibenevolent. He has all of his, all of the divine attributes. Now, if you remove even one of his divine attributes, you no longer have God, right? You can't have 90% God. It's, it's an all or nothing deal. But a lot of people think that Jesus was not omniscient when he was on earth because of that statement that he made uh, of that day and hour. Remember this? Of that day and hour, no one knows, not the Father, uh, not the angel. I mean, excuse me, not the angels in heaven, not the Son, but only the Father. And so some people take that to mean that when Jesus was on, his, when was on earth, there were some things that he did not know. In other words, he was not omniscient. But let's let Scripture interpret Scripture, right? That's how we should do hermeneutics. Good hermeneutics, let Scripture inter interpret Scripture. I want to show you a passage out of the Gospel of John. The disciples said to Jesus, Now we know that you know all things. Now we know that you know all things. Now, if Jesus did not know all things, what a great opportunity for Jesus to do what? To correct their theology, right? great opportunity for Jesus to correct their theology. What a great opportunity for him to say to his disciples, now wait a minute guys, um, I can understand how you would think that I know all things. I can understand how you got that impression, but I really don't. I used to, before I came to this earth, when I was in heaven, I, I did then, and one day later, once I'm resurrected and ascended and go back to the Father, then I will again, but for right now, I don't. There are some things I just don't know right now. That would be a great opportunity for Jesus to correct their theology, right? Is that what he did? No. Jesus responded, Do you now believe? Do you now believe? He didn't correct them. He affirmed them. Do you now believe? Yes, I do know all things, because I am God. So, of what did Jesus empty himself? Jesus did not empty himself of his deity. He did not empty himself of any of his divine attributes. Jesus merely emptied himself of his divine prerogative to exercise some of those attributes. On occasions, Jesus chose not to exercise some of those attributes. It does not mean he didn't have them. It does not mean he didn't have access to them. Occasionally, he just chose not to exercise them. The following is a prophecy given to Kenneth Copeland, supposedly by Jesus Christ. According to Kenneth Copeland, Jesus physically appeared to him and said this to him. Don't be disturbed when people accuse you of thinking you are God. They crucified me for claiming that I was God, but I didn't claim I was God. I just claimed that I walked with him. He was in me. Hallelujah. That's what you're doing. Blasphemy. Dear friends, Jesus most certainly did claim to be God. Before Abraham was, I am. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Jesus uh, raised the dead. Jesus forgave sin, something that only God can do. So Jesus most certainly did claim to be God. In any Jesus that he is preaching, who did not claim to be God is not the Jesus of the Bible. If they preach a different Jesus, they preach a different gospel. And a different gospel does not save. Watch this video clip from Larry Huck and Paula White. When we really begin to understand that, that, that when Jesus Christ paid the price, the first thing that happened after he said it is finished is the veil was rent from top to bottom, signifying that no man could do that. But the price that was paid was there's now no separation. So that we have direct access in the Holy of Holies. We understand, according to Hebrews, that Jesus is our high priest. Absolutely. And he's the first of many brethren, which means I now come into a priestly anointing. So I now come Say that again because now, they don't get it. I now come into a priestly anointing. Jesus is not the only begotten on. Son of God. He is not. I'm a Son of he's God. He's the first fruit. You, you're the, he's the first fruit. He's the first born of many. Anointing. Jesus is not the only begotten on. Son of God. 
Can you believe that? Flat out denying that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. Have they read John 3.16? Friends, this is stunning. You know, we're not talking here about who you think wrote the book of Hebrews. We're not talking here about whether you're pre-trib or mid-trib in your eschatology. These issues go to the heart of the gospel. What one determines or believes about Jesus Christ will determine where one spends eternity. And I'm going to say something may sound a little heretical in and of itself at first, but bear with me. Dear friends, it's not enough to just believe in Jesus. It's not enough to just believe in Jesus. Mormons believe in Jesus. Jehovah's Witnesses believe in Jesus. Muslims believe in Jesus. You've got to believe in the right Jesus. The Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses and, and the, uh, the Muslims, they have a different Jesus. Oh, they say they believe in Jesus, but not the Jesus of the Bible. You've got to believe in the Jesus of the Bible. If they preach a different Jesus, they preach a different gospel. Watch this clip from Rod Parsley. Rod Parsley is a word faith preacher in Ohio, and uh, this, is, this is shocking. It's very brief, but the context of this is Rod Parsley is trying to raise money for his ministry, but listen to what he says here very carefully. Because when Naaman obeyed that instruction, the miracle of God was released just like I'm believing with you right now. Somebody's laying hold on a miracle. I can, I can perceive it. I, I can perceive that virtue's going forth out of me. I feel your faith pulling on me right now. Did you catch that? Rod Parsley says, I perceive that virtue is going forth from me. Of course, when we hear something like that, we automatically think of what account in the Scripture? We think of the, the woman with the issue of blood, right? Who reached out and touched the hem of Jesus' garment. He said, who touched me? He said, for I perceived that virtue flowed out of me. So Rod Parsley says he feels virtue flowing out of him? He says, I feel your faith tugging on me? So, our, so now he is the object of our faith? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Dear friends, these people are not Christians. They are not Christians. Word of faith preachers, teachers, New Apostolic Reformation, they are not Christians. Oh, Justin, you're saying that they're not saved? That's exactly what I'm saying. That is exactly what I'm saying. Oh, that sounds so harsh. That's so judgmental. Dear friends, if the Holy Spirit is strong enough to save us, He is also strong enough to deliver us out of deception. And if these people were truly indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, in the first time, the very first time they taught something that blasphemous, the Holy Spirit would be screaming at them. And yet they teach, they have taught these heresies for years, for decades, over and over and over and over, and there's no conviction. There's no, there's no discipline. There's no Hebrews 12 in their life. That is not somebody who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God would not allow this kind of blasphemy to be coming from someone who belongs to him. They are not Christians. I want us now to look at the spiritual death of Jesus. All of the prosperity preachers teach this, that Jesus' physical death on the cross was not enough to pay for sins, that Jesus also had to die a spiritual death, that when Jesus died on the cross, the work of the atonement wasn't finished, it had just begun. And when Jesus died on the cross, then he went to hell. And he suffered and was tormented in hell, tortured by the demons, ceased to be God, and then he had to be reborn. They actually teach that Jesus had to get 
saved. Jesus had to go through that same spiritual death in order to pay the price. Now, it wasn't the physical death on the cross that paid the price for sin, because if it had been, any prophet of God that had died for the last couple of thousand years before that could have paid that price. It wasn't physical death. Anybody could do that. It wasn't the physical death of Jesus that paid for our sins. Anybody could have done that. No, Mr. Copeland, nobody else could have done that because no one else is sinless. This from Copeland as well. He paid the price. He suffered so you and I don't have to go there. Now, if he hadn't suffered it in the spirit as well as the flesh, the flesh cannot make sacrifice for spiritual things. If the flesh could make sacrifice for spiritual things, then the, the, the flesh of animals would have gone a lot closer and a lot further than they did. The Spirit then, Jesus' very own holy, pure, sinless Spirit paid the sin price for your spirit. This from Bill Johnson. I think this clip works. Well, we have uh, a little dramatic thing uh, presented to you. Dra I don't know, did you know that Jesus was born again? I asked the first, first, first service. And he said no. Did you know that Jesus was born again? See, they teach that Jesus died spiritually in hell, ceased to be God, and had to be born again. He had to get saved. Dear friends, this is heresy. This is heresy. If there was ever a time in which Jesus was not God, if he ceased to be God, dear friends, and Jesus never was God to begin with. Because God cannot cease being God. Are there some things that God cannot do? We often think, well, God can do anything. Are there things that God cannot do? Yes, there are. There are some things that God cannot do. God cannot lie. God cannot sin. God cannot deny himself. And God cannot cease to be God. So if there was ever a time when Jesus was not God, he never was God to begin with. He is the same yesterday, forever, yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. He does not change. He does not change. And so if there was ever a time when he was not God, even for an instant, he never was God in the first place. Now, in dealing with the spiritual death of Jesus, I want us to look at what Jesus said on the cross. Because a lot of people believe that this statement from Jesus means that Jesus died spiritually, or if he didn't die spiritually, at least he was completely and totally separated from God. Let's look at Psalm 22, verse 1. Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And a lot of people take this to mean that Jesus either died spiritually or he was completely and totally separated from the Father. Now, we've already talked about how Jesus could not have died spiritually, could not cease to be God. Impossibility. Uh, but we also have to be very careful when we say that Jesus was completely and totally separated from the Father, okay? A lot of people teach this, that when Jesus was on the cross for the first and only time in all of eternity, God the Father and God the Son were separated. Like you would cut a ribbon in half in just complete and total separation. Be very careful with that. If Jesus did not cease to be God, and yet God the Father and God the Son were completely and totally separated, then now we've got two independent, coexisting gods. We can't have that either. We're not polytheists. One God. One God revealed in three persons. Not three manifestations, by the way. That's modalism. Three persons. And so if, if you split the Trinity, then 
you've no longer got God because he is a trained God. So what do we do with this? What does this mean? Well, let's look at the context here of Psalm 22. A little bit fuller context. Let's look at a few other verses. Same chapter. The psalmist, David, continues. He says, But be not thou far from me, O Lord, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither has he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. Friends, I think we have to bend our knee and we have to admit that there is a certain mystery to exactly what Jesus experienced on the cross that we will never fully understand this side of heaven. We won't. I don't understand it. There is a mystery there. And when it comes to the atonement, the, the uh, sacrifice of Christ on the cross, we have to be careful not to say, not to take it too far in the sense that when, the, when people say that God the Son and God the Father were completely and totally separated, like again, like you cut a ribbon, separated, that takes it too far. Uh, but it's also important we don't say too little about it. Was the agony of the cross the, uh, the, the nails? Yes. The flagellation, the whipping? Yes. Uh, the, the bruising, yes. The beard being plucked out, yes. The crown of thorns, yes. The thirst that Jesus experienced, yes. All of this physical suffering, yes. That was all part of the cross, absolutely. But it was more than that. It was more than that. When Jesus was on the cross, he did not turn into sin, but he was made a sin offering for us. He bore our sins, and when Jesus bore our sins, the full, undiluted wrath of God was poured out on the Son. And yes, Jesus drank in every drop of God's fury. And so it was far more than just physical suffering. It was spiritual as well. And when Jesus was on the cross, in his humanity, in his humanity, Jesus undoubtedly experienced real estrangement, real separation from the Father in his humanity. But in his deity, Jesus was not separated from the Father. That's an impossibility. God cannot be divided against himself. Because look here, it says right here, the psalmist David be not far from me, O Lord. He has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither has he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. What else did Jesus say on the cross? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Jesus was praying to the Father on the cross. And so we know that those lines of communication, if you will, uh, within the triune Godhead were still intact. In his humanity, yes, real estrangement, real separation. But in his deity, he was never separated totally from the Father. Again, a mystery. A mystery, but we accept it. It was the physical death of Jesus that atoned for our sins. We could point to many, many verses in Scripture for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or in heaven, having made, made, having made peace through the what? Through the blood of his cross. Peter writes this, For Christ also died for sins, how many times? Once for all. Not twice, not once physically and once spiritually, once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit of God. Paul writes, book of Romans, chapter 5, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him, in whom we have redemption through his 
blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. It was the physical death of Jesus that atoned for sins. What else did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. His work was completed on the cross, not in hell. His work was completed on the cross. Something that you'll notice about every cult is every cult disparages the cross of Jesus Christ. Then it somehow just was not enough to atone for sins. Mormons disparage it. Jehovah's Witnesses disparage the cross. Roman Catholicism disparages the cross of Christ. I'm not sure if you're aware. Did you know Roman Catholics, when they have Mass, they call it the sacrifice of the Mass, right? The sacrifice of the Mass. That's very important. Catholics believe that when you take the host, the little cracker, the little piece of bread, when the priest takes the host, that this piece of bread literally turns into the actual flesh of Jesus Christ. And then the priest lifts it up. He lifts up the little piece of bread, the little cracker, and he says, we offer up this victim. Victim. Friends, Jesus never was, is not now, nor will he ever be a victim. He is the ultimate victor. And they say, we offer up this victim in sacrifice. They call it the sacrifice of the mass. It, it, they are literally, in Catholic theology, they are literally sacrificing Jesus over and over and over and over and over. Every time Catholics have Mass, they are sacrificing. They believe sacrificing Christ. To put it very bluntly, what they really believe they're doing, they're killing him. They're killing him. That's what they believe. It's kind of ironic that Roman Catholics are pro-life when it comes to the issue of abortion. In and of itself, I'm glad they are. You don't even have to be a Christian to know it's wrong to kill an unborn child. Wrong to kill a baby. But it's kind of ironic that they're pro-life when it comes to abortion, at least theoretically. But when it comes to Jesus, they're pro-death. They have no problem killing Jesus. They kill him every time they have mass. Thousands and thousands of times all around the world every single day. And Catholics do not believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Catholics believe you have to add works to your faith. You've got to go to confession. You've got to confess your sins to a priest who's just as sinful, if not more so, than you are. And then you've got to do your penance. You've got to say your Hail Marys, and you've got to say your Our Fathers, and you've got to you do all these things. You add your works to your faith. And then when you die, you get to go to purgatory, a place that does not even exist. But you get to go to purgatory and have all your other sins burned up that Jesus somehow did not pay for. So you spend X number of years in purgatory and then once those sins are paid for, then you get to... That's an offense to the gospel. That's an offense to the gospel. That's a different gospel. That's a work salvation. Catholicism is a different gospel. And, and Catholics... Did you know it's still official Roman Catholic doctrine? They adapted a series of anathemas in the Council of Trent in the year 1563, I think it is, Council of Trent. They adopted a series of anathemas. In other words, if you believe these things, you're going to go to hell. There's no hope for you. One of the things that they call anathema, if you believe in salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, you are anathema. You're damned. And yet, that's the gospel. And that remains official Roman Catholic doctrine to this day. So we should love our Catholic friends enough. We should love them enough to tell them the truth. Any gospel that adds works is a different gospel. Jesus said, it is finished. We'll close with this verse of Scripture. We'll be done until this afternoon. Peter writes, False prophets arose among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, not maybe, will be, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. A false teacher doesn't come to you with flags waving, guns blazing, saying, I'm a false teacher. He'll have some truth, some truth, but mixed in with that truth, error and heresy. 
secretly introducing destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. Any man who would teach that Jesus did not come as God is denying the Jesus of the Bible. Bringing swift destruction upon themselves. When their destruction comes, and it will, it will be swift. Peter says many will follow their sensuality. Many. This movement is huge. It is growing. By reason of whom the way of truth will be maligned. What way of truth? The way of truth. The gospel will be maligned. It will be distorted. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. The King James Version puts it this way. It says, they will make merchandise out of you. And all of the faith preachers are opulently wealthy. And they are making merchandise out of sick and hurting and desperate people. And they are growing rich off of distorting the gospel. Every phrase in this passage of Scripture fits to a T what we see today in the modern health and wealth, prosperity gospel, every phrase. I hope this has been helpful for you, just a bird's eye view of the Word of Faith movement and uh, New Apostolic Reformation, what they teach. And I hope you see now that, that it is indeed a different gospel. Uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer and, and, um, and we'll conclude. Our Father, we do thank you for uh, this day. Lord, it's, on the one hand, it's, it's troubling to see these things. It, it should trouble our hearts when we see your gospel being distorted, when we see your name being blasphemed. These should trouble us and distress us. Um, but at the same time, in, in, a, in, a, in a certain way, it's comforting because we know we, we should expect this. Your word warns us about false teachers, false prophets who will teach doctrines of demons, who will distort the gospel. Uh, you have not left us ignorant. This comes as no surprise to us. So, so we take, uh, in some way, we, we take some comfort in seeing your word fulfilled, and we rest in that. But may we be aware of, of, the, um, of what is being taught, and may we be ready to speak your truth to people, to be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within us, to, to know doctrine, to know theology, uh, so that we can confront the error and, by your grace, uh, snatch people from the fires. These things we ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen.